If you have a Bible, would you go ahead and turn with me over to Luke chapter 9, uh, Luke chapter 9, uh, starting in verse uh, 21. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, we have a Bible in the chair in front of you. We want you to have that as a gift. Also, a place for you to uh, keep connected in the, the back of the bulletin as we, as we uh, talk through this message. Uh, Mike, I appreciate the uh, helping and the team leading us in worship, and even just those words of, Jesus, we love you. You are the one thing our heart longs for, and um, if you've been following cars for any time, you know that's, that's so true, that we can, we can try to get on, a de- we get on a detour and trying to find all these other things, but ultimately our heart, our heart longs. We have this, this God-shaped hole in our heart that only Jesus can fill, and so we're so thankful for this time that we can, we can gather together. Um, again, Luke 9 is where we're going to, to be today. Um, we're in the series called Hard Sayings of Jesus. And we started last week with the idea of loving your enemies, which we talked about is not an easy thing to do at all. In fact, all these, hence the name hard sayings of Jesus, are very difficult things to do. All these passages we're going to look at, at, words of Jesus, are very challenging. But as we put in the the bulletin on the image, I love the idea that there's echoes of grace. And you're going to see echo of grace in all these texts we look at. You're going to see that in today's as well as God's grace, even though these these passages we look at them like, man, who in the world can do this? Again, that's what the disciples said in John 6. 60, who could live by this? And, and again, we can only th- do it through his power and his, his grace. I want to start by talking about uh, faith. Um, and you can define faith in a, a variety of different ways. Hebrews 11 probably does it better than any of us can do it uh, as far as defining uh, the author of Hebrews defined it uh, in a way. But I, I think for us, it's just simply boiled down to it's this trust, uh, it's a confidence, it's this belief. And uh, there, there's kind of this pendulum, in fact, it's in your bulletin, there's a pendulum that we're kind of on where you've got these two words, you've kind of got this idea of easy belief. Um, actually, I wanted to put in the blanks easy beliefism, but I got voted out by the office staff because they said beliefism isn't actually a word, which it should be, but it's not. Um, easy beliefism versus asceticism, okay? And uh, let me describe both of you because I think this will really help us in this pathway we have in trying to understand our faith uh, this idea of easy belief or easy beliefism is just this idea of, of following Jesus without really any change or any repentance uh, as, as a necessary aspect of our faith. And I, I'll tell you, the Bible knows nothing of that. There's certainly, whenever we are called uh, in Scripture, whenever you see these, these stories of faith, there's certainly this call towards a change. There's certainly a call towards repentance uh, that is there. So the Bible doesn't know about this idea. Um, what ends up happening so often, unfortunately, in, in our culture, and not just here, but across even the world as well, is there's almost this, you know, we're in this Olympic season. And there's almost this time where we will find people that are people of faith and we'll kind of root them on, like kind of team Jesus. Like, hey, this person's really good at this faith thing. They're really living it out, and so I'm going to root for them. But the Bible doesn't talk about that idea. The idea is that we are all, whether we're a pastor, whether we are uh, a, uh, uh, an elder, whether we are a volunteer in a church, doesn't matter. We are all to be uh, moving forward the gospel together. So it's nothing with this like we just root on team Jesus. We are part of Team Jesus, and we are, we are, we are moving the, the gospel forward. So the, this easy beliefism, where it's just this belief that really doesn't change your life, doesn't exist. The opposite side of it is you got this word asceticism, which is not a word I know we use often, but it's just this deep uh, self-denial. You might know, and I, I don't think you see it quite as often, but you might know. In fact, we'll put a picture on the screen. Uh, there was a, a group of um, early church fathers that actually practiced this thing uh, that they called desert fathers. And basically what they did is they just lived their Christian life out literally in the desert. Why did they do that? Is because they wanted to get away from all the temptations of life. Here's the problem with temptations. is temptations travel, don't they? So you could move away from all this stuff. You think, well, I'm going to move away from the city life. I'm going to go in the country, and I'm not going to have these. Well, no, the temptations will follow us. And so they, they live this life, deep self-denial, basically become hermits. Um, you know, we have people today that live in monasteries and that, that sort of thing, but they'd be places in Egypt and Palestine, Syria, living out away from those, those things. Here's the problem with, with that, though, again, is that we have been called to be salt and light. And there certainly is a calling at times to, to get away. I mean, we even see Jesus doing that. But yet he's also called us to be salt, light, and ambassador here on this earth. So this pendulum of faith, whether you're in this deep self-denial or whether it's easy belief, neither are correct. And I think what you're going to see today, what you're going to see today is what it should look more life, like. And it's a calling by Jesus, and it's kind of uh, when you follow Jesus. In fact, uh, I've said this phrase a number of times: is that when you follow Jesus and He is your Savior, He can't be your Savior without being your Lord. Does that make sense? 
He can't be your Savior without being your Lord. You, you have to submit. You have to surrender your life. You're going to do it perfectly. Absolutely not. But you need to, a surrendered life uh, to him. And that's what following Christ is. And that's the hard saying we're going to see to Jesus, of today of Jesus, where he talks about his own life and the, his own surrender that he dealt with and that his disciples, too, would follow that same thing. And we, as Christians today, should follow that, uh, that as well. And so we're going to look at this calling. But here's the kind of the maybe sermon and sentence idea in your first blank is this, is this passage that we're going to look at exhorts those who want to live for Christ to live, in your blank there, is boldly, no matter the challenges or matter, no matter the threats that you will fa- you'll face. So we're going to take a look at this text today from Luke uh, chapter 9 together. But before we do, let's take a moment and let's pray together. Uh, God, you are good. Uh, and as we sing that song, we love you. And you are the one thing our hearts long for. You're, you're the one thing our hearts desire after. And so, Lord, today, as I pray each and every week, that as we open this text, that you illuminate it to us, that it, that it makes sense, not so we have more knowledge, but you transform our hearts, that we become more uh, like you. And so I, I pray that whatever distractions we have, whatever we have in this afternoon, that your word will get the focus, uh, your word uh, would draw us in, uh, again, to be more like you, and again, whatever, whatever we have on our minds, uh, that, that this would get our, our attention. Lord, that you would get the glory and that you would get the honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kind of breaking this text down, three things I want to point, put across to you today. Number one is this, the reality of suffering and sacrifice for Jesus. The reality of sa- suffering and sacrifice for Jesus. Let's start in verse 21. It says this, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. Okay. Now, if you're reading the Bible here, you should ask the question, what is this? Can you do that with me? Can you ask the question, what is this? All right. What, what should we not tell anybody? Is Jesus like saying this great hiding spot? What's he, what's he trying to say? Well, if you go above it, and it won't be on your screen, we know this, is that Jesus asked the question, who do the crowd say I am? Now, Jesus was not having an identity crisis. He wasn't trying to figure out, well, I don't really know who I am, like kind of what we have in, I'd say, teenager, but we, we all struggle with that kind of identity. He wasn't having an identity crisis at all. Instead, what he was asking is, really, what he wanted to know was, who did the disciples say it? And, and so they reply, the disciples, some say Elijah, some say the prophets, some say uh, John the Baptist, <clears throat> but then Jesus uh, asks directly the question, well, who, what about you? He asks, who do you say I am? And then, depending on the translation, he says, you are the Christ or you are the Messiah, which is really where we get the, the good confession of faith, the confession of faith that we have, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he's, he's, he warned them not to tell anyone, in large part because he didn't want his popularity to crest too fast because he knew he had to go through Jerusalem. He knew he had to suffer. We know from the Garden of Gethsemane, we know the Lord asked, Lord, if it's possible, take this cup of suffering away, but you might know the next words, not my will, but what? But yours be done. So he didn't, he didn't desire, he said, if there's a plan B, is it all possible, but Lord, I will do whatever you ask and then, so he didn't want that popularity to grow too fast because he knew he had to go through Jerusalem, verse 22. And he said, the Son of Man, talking about himself, one of the common names for him, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed on the third day and be raised to life. Now, there's no way the disciples got the full weight of this. No way at this point. But I want you to hear from, from their perspective what they heard in, in this statement. Um, in fact, you're blank there. Jesus' words as a rabbi, and I added the word Messiah in there, would have absolutely just been stunning. Because here we are, these disciples, these, I mean, basically young, late teenagers, early adults, left their lives to follow this rabbi, to follow this Messiah. They had heard about this Messiah that was coming, but definitely to leave this, this for this rabbi. And he's saying what is going to happen to him was, and I have these underlined in my Bible, that he's going to suffer, he was going to be rejected, and he'd be killed. And they're like, what? We, we just left our life for that? Like, that's what's going to happen? They, you know, think of it, we're in a, everybody's excited about it, I'm sure, we're in this political season. Okay? Can you imagine if one of the presidential candidates said, hey, you're going you're gonna to join my campaign team, but this is what is going to happen to me? Most of the people would be out and say, I'll see you. I'm not going to be a part of that. Like, they left everything to follow this, and this is exactly what was going to happen to Jesus, but it's going to get worse for them in, in a little bit. And remember, this is Jesus, the only perfect man that ever lived. Man, God, 100% God, 100% man that ever lived. And he lived this life that was poured out for others. In fact, when the disciples are arguing, like, who was going to sit in the right and left and all this, here's what Jesus said, Mark 10, 45, it'll be on your screen. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Many of you guys know the passage when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and he says, go and do likewise. 
Jesus wasn't starting this new ceremony like what we kind of we do with Lord's Supper or whatever. He was saying, hey, literally, not, not necessarily literally wash feet, but literally want you to serve other people. And so sometimes that means when they're at their worst or when, it's, when it feels like this is below me, this is what I want you to do. Go and do likewise. Mark 10, 45, he called us to serve so again, these disciples are thinking, what did we sign up? He was, this Messiah was supposed to be this great victor, living in this great victory, and that victory would come. We'll see that in the passage. But he said before that, I must suffer. I, must be, I, must, I will be rejected, and I will be killed. What's interesting is another gospel. Uh, one, of the, one of the things about the gospels that I love is that, is that uh, even the four gospels, the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very similar. They're called the synoptic. They're very similar to one another. But even they have their own um, way of describing a situation. The same way if we saw a car accident out here, all of us would describe it just a little bit different. And in this exact same text we see in Matthew, it'll be on your screen, this is the same thing is said, and here's what happens. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, being rebuking this, his rabbi, Jesus. He says, never, Lord. He said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned to it and, and, said, and said to Peter, and he said, get behind me. What word does he use? Satan. What a pet name, all right? Get behind me, Satan. And he says, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind, the, the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. To say this, and Mike mentioned earlier, he was, Jesus was tested and he was tempted in every way. So this temptation had already gotten his mind from Satan. He recognized that's where it was coming from. He's saying, Peter, I don't want that. Like, no, this is what's going to happen to me. What I find so interesting in this account in Luke, none of Peter's words are there as far as that goes. But I kind of wonder if, if Peter went up to Luke and said, hey, Luke, will you kind of, I'll give you five bucks. Will you kind of leave that out of this, this, uh, this gospel account? Because it's kind of embarrassing to be called Satan. He didn't want that in there. And so he's saying this is what is going to happen to him. Again, the disciples aren't understanding this. There are other places arguing who's, the, who's going to be the greatest, who's going to sit in the left and right, all that. The disciples did not understand. They understood the idea that this Messiah was supposed to be a conquering Messiah, was supposed to lead them over this political victory over Rome. That's what their understanding was. But now we have privilege of knowing, and what we see, and we'll talk about a little bit later, is that these disciples were eventually emboldened in their faith and turned the world upside down for the gospel. In fact, what we see in here, it says, and he must be killed, speaking of himself, on the third day and be raised to life. And that's important. You can, you can fly right by that, but understanding in the Jewish culture, a person was actually dead, not the moment they stopped breathing, but it was after three days. Like your soul and spirit was all confirmed to be dead after that moment. And so this is Jesus basically uh, confirming, uh, the, uh, confirming his, that resurrection and confirming his deity because nobody else could do that. I mean, again, that a person was literally dead after those three days, and he was saying that after three days, I will rise again. So that's where the disciples are hearing that this is what's going to happen to him. So they're probably scratching their heads at this moment thinking, what did we sign up for? Like, I left everything to follow you, Jesus, and you're saying that you're going to be, you're going to be uh, killed. You said you're going to be rejected. You're going to suffer. And like, like, what does that mean for us? Jesus is about to tell us what happens, which is leads to number two, the call of suffering and sacrifice for us. This is where it gets more personal. Look at verse 23. And he said to them all, he said, whoever, whoever wants to be my disciple, they must deny themselves. They need to take up their cross and they, they, they follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for somebody to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their very soul? Now, I need you to understand, when he says, take up the cross, the disciples would have had one image in their mind. And that would have been a, a Galilean uh, uh, walking through the streets uh, of, of, of a Roman-occupied area and carrying the cross. In fact, we have a slide that exactly what it would have looked like. Wouldn't, they would just carry that beam, and that beam probably, and if you know the story of Jesus, Jesus carried that beam. That's where they would carry. They would carry the cross to the point, or that beam, to the place where they were to die. So that cross is already in the ground there, and they would bring the horizontal cross to that place. And really, the point of it was, I mean, it was painful for sure. But it was more a humiliation, more a reminder who's really in charge. And at that point, it was Rome. And saying, carry your cross meant like you're going to suffer. And you would only carry your cross for one reason, and that was to die. And so when the disciples hear this, like, what? Like, not only are you going to suffer, but we are as well. Like, we are going to have to go through the exact same thing. That's what it would have meant. It would have almost been like today, bringing up uh, the phrase, like, lethal injection. 
You know, if anybody wants to follow me, lethal injection's coming. That, that's the idea, or a gallows back in the day, or whatever it may be, electric chair, those, those things. David Guzik, who's a, 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 a theologian, he wrote there, a commentary, right? He says this, a cross was hung on a man before a man was hung on a cross. So it's like this idea of, like, that means death. Again, this is a hard saying of Jesus, saying that it's not just about I'm going to suffer and be rejected, but the same thing is going to happen to you even up to death. The disciples have to be scratching their head at this point. And when it says the phrase, then he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple. So when I say this line, I want you to like put your name in there. So when I read it, I'm going to read it, and then first service we struggle with this. We're going to get this this hour, all right? When I'm going to read it, when it says whoever, I want you to say your name. Everybody know your name? All right, good. All right, here we go. Then he said to them, Let's try it again, all right? We're going to get there. Then he said to them, Jeff, there you go, wants to be, if Jeff wants to be my disciple, or whatever your name is, he must deny himself. Take up the cross daily, we'll get to that moment, and follow me. This idea of daily. Not just at camp one time when I was in my teens, I gave my life to Jesus, or at CIY I did this, or you know when I was in my 20s and 30s. It's like now I'm giving my life. It's this present tense. Like you are continually doing this. This is what it looks like to follow Jesus. Not this physical death per se, but it could be up to that. But more this idea of spiritual death. Let's look at these call, these three words. It says the first part is to deny ourselves. Is it easy to deny ourselves? No, in this culture... In our world, it's, it's about, most of the time, we think about what I want, what's convenient to me. A living a life of self-denial, like even as I talked about the desert fathers, these guys in the second, third century that would like give up everything and go live in the desert and all that kind of stuff, man, it's like, no thanks. Like, I like the idea of camping maybe or clamping or whatever, or whatever they call that, but I like that idea where it's really comfortable for me, but when it's, but when it's, when it's difficult, no, nah, I'm, I'm not really into that. That's what he's calling us to. He's calling us to this idea of of not following self-interest, not pursuing myself, not pursuing what I want. It's so very countercultural, so different than the self-gratification culture that we often live in. John 15, 20, he puts it this, remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. To say this, if this happened to you, which as I said, this is going to happen to me, this is also going to happen to you as well. This is why this is a hard saying of Jesus. It would be a tough pill to swallow. And we know many times Jesus talked, and it's, it's interesting, it's just a, it's kind of a subtle line in the text, but so many times when Jesus spoke and he would say these challenges, we'll look at some of these over the next number of weeks, said the people walked away. Like, who's going to live like this? Who would ever live like this? John Piper, who's a, uh, he wrote this, he said, um, he said the great trade-off of much of contemporary Christianity is that the cross is safely relegated to the distant past. And practically it meant that Jesus was soaked in blood, so I could, I could soak in a jacuzzi. And the bigger the tub, the more we honor Christ, so the cross. So goes the prosperity gospel. And so we kind of try to clean up the cross is what he's saying. We try to clean up the cross and say, well, you know, following Jesus, you're going to maybe sacrifice a little bit here and there. But when, when we look at this passage, this is a life of denial, a life of willingness to say, I'm willing to die for what I believe. I, I'm, I've surrendered what I desire. It's not about myself anymore. It's about living for you. That's why the prosperity gospel sells in our culture. Again, I, 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 I don't get enamored any longer with uh, big churches or anything like that. I think they, they offer some things, but one of the things uh, to remind myself is the biggest church in America, which I don't, doesn't even need to be named, is a prosperity gospel church. It's a prosperity gospel church. It's the biggest church in America. Why? Because it tickles the ears of the people. Like, oh, that sounds good. But that's not what the gospel calls us to. It calls us to the willingness to, again, he suffered, he was rejected, he was killed. We need to deny ourselves. We need to take up our cross and follow him. So that's the denial part that we need to live in, of denying, saying, this isn't even about me. Second part is to take up the cross. And again, we've already talked about that. Galatians 2.20 will be on your screen. I've been crucified with Christ. And so I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Basically say this is when you follow Christ, you're dying to your old self. It doesn't mean that you're still not yourself. And God created you in, uh, in his image if you are if you're a follower, you're a child of God, but he's, yet it's like, I'm dying to, to myself. 
I'm dying to the way I, I lived. I'm dying to the way that I, I, I want to live. You know, that, one of the things I, I heard years ago is that when we start following Christ, uh, there should be like a, uh, a warning symbol uh, on, on our baptism certificate. Because it's saying that, that the moment that you start following Christ, guess who's going to come after you? Satan. Spiritual warfare is real. And he's going to come after you. He's got the world, but he's going to come after us. And so it's this idea of, of denying myself, taking up a cross, basically saying, I'm, I'm dying to myself. I'm no longer living for what Jeff Chamberlain wants. I'm living for his, his glory. I'm living for him. I'm not going to do it perfectly, but I want to live my life. And so bearing, when you say bear your cross, you've, you've heard people say, well, that's my cross to bear. It, it's not just a, a Christian term because really all of us in this life have struggles. Whether you're a believer or not, you have struggles. But there are certain things that are unique to being a believer that you're going to have struggles. You know, it might be, you might have opposition from loved ones. And again, everybody has opposition potentially from loved ones. But there are those that uh, when they start following Christ, that their family turns their back on them. Their family says, no, 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 we taught you differently. We taught you better. I can't believe you're going down this road. Particularly those Christians that are, are not Christian nations, and I know we are a post-Christian world here as well, but that it means everything, including their livelihood to follow them. Forsaking the comforts of this life, the, the idea of complete dependence on God, not dependence on myself, but dependence on God. There's times where it's lonely, all right? I know those that have started following Christ that they've lost a number of friends. And because of that, it can, it can be lonely. It can, you, you might suffer, again, uh, uh, slander your way. Whatever those things are, this is what it means in Christ that take up your cross, meaning I'm willing to suffer for the gospel. I'm willing to suffer for this relationship. That's what it means. And then the last part of it says to follow me. Let's look at a couple passages real quick. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 puts it this way. This is not a carnal way of living. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then verse 5 talks about that's the way Jesus lived and we are to follow his example. Again, carnally, naturally, I'm not going to put others' needs above my own. That is what we are called to do as believers. That's what Jesus did, putting others' needs before himself. The Bible says while we were still sinners, while we were still in our, our sins, that Christ died for us. He put himself on the cross while we were spitting upon what he did for us. While we, he, we could even care less what he did for us. That is what he did. We're to serve God. James 4, 13 through 15 says this. Now listen. Uh, to you who say, today or tomorrow, I'm going to do this or that, or go to this city. Spend a year there, carry on business and make money. He says, why? You, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, it's the Lord's will. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. That is way, the way we should live. It doesn't mean that we are, we are so um, stuck in life that it's like, unless I hear God's audible voice, I'm not going to do this. But ultimately, we're always looking, Lord, what do you desire in this? We, talk, we had a whole series on what is the will of God in our life on our, our midweek. We talked about the primary way that we can find out the will of God in our life is right here. It's God's word. If something, if we feel like we should go a different direction or we're feeling prompted to go in a different direction that would be opposed to God's word, that is not from the Lord. That's from Satan. We need to follow what the Lord's will in our life. And then the last part is serving others out of unity. 1 Corinthians uh, 1.10 says this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another. Uh, in what you say, and that there may be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Now, are we, liter are we always going to agree with one another? The answer is no. We're not going to always agree on certain things. There's going to be secondary things that we are not always going to agree on. But, but Scripture makes it clear we should be united, particularly on those primary things. Man, we need to be united with one another. That's why the Bible talks about not having like um, foolish talk uh, to, to bring us into disunity. You know, I, I think, uh, I don't necessarily put this in, in necessarily foolish talk, but even in this season, I mean, we're 90 days away from election or something like that. You know, that, that it's, it's going to be really challenging from our culture because there are people who feel very strongly on either side of the equation. And, and it's a really challenging time because that, the, the fact that somebody votes differently than you, they can still be your brother and sister in Christ. You can still love them. And so maybe you, you have some boundaries in your life. These are things I'm not going to discuss. It's okay to believe this, this about this, and it's okay for them to believe this. We might have some conversations, but I want to make sure I stay united. That's what Scripture calls us to do, to be united in one another, still maybe having a different view on something.
So the question is, is how do you order your priorities? We're going to have a little just test in here. In fact, I want you to, if you have your bulletin out there, uh, I want you to say, how do you order your priorities? Let's say you have three things. You have self, God, and others. I want you to write down uh, on there, or if you don't have a pen, just put it in your mind. From a carnal perspective, what priority order do you put that in? And then from a spiritual perspective, what order do you put those three in? Take 20 seconds. I won't play the Jeopardy music. Fill that out uh, under uh, what do you put under carnal and spiritual. Take 20 seconds to do that. All right, hopefully you got it uh, now. The way, uh, the way that I think Scripture points us to filling this out is, is I think, carnally. My, my thought is carnally. This is the way I would naturally live without Christ in the, in the picture, without any God uh, mindset, is that I would put myself first, I'd put others second, and God last, because God's not even in the equation for me. If we live in a spiritual perspective, Scripture calls us towards this. Is, uh, of course, the greatest commandment is love God first, and then love others, and then self. So it goes God others, self. Notice it's flipped, right? Notice it's flipped. It's totally flipped on how our priorities should be in, in, as far as God's self and others. That is how we are to live, which is so counter to what this world has to say. And then verse 24 says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will gain it. I, I would say this, is that you won't, you won't fully live until, in some ways, you figure out what you'll lose your life over. Okay, you won't fully live until you lose your life. Let me, let me try to explain it this way. Let's say you have a seed in, in your hand right there, and that seed is fully intact. And you hold on to that seed. And you just hold on to it, and you look at it, and look how nice it is and how pretty it is. And you, you examine it, and you look at it each day, and that seed never changes. Well, that seed will never fulfill its purpose until it does what? Until it like, goes in the ground and dies and germinates and grows into something where it's supposed to be. And I think it's the same thing for us, is that we'll never find our purpose. We'll never fully fill it until we, are, we figure out, hey, I'm willing to lose everything for the gospel. I'm willing to lose it all. I'm willing to give it all up because, so I'm willing to, I'm willing to be uncomfortable. I'm willing to do what the world might say is unhealthy. I'm willing to do whatever for the sake of the gospel. That is when you truly find life. Where fear may still be there, but we overcome fear because we know that God is bigger than the fears that we have in our life. That is what it means to truly live when we die and we find that life. Because here's what we know, and in fact, verse 24 says, for whoever wants to save their life are going to lose it. That you can try to protect your life. You can bubble wrap your life. You can do all that. But guess what's going to happen? You're, we're all going to take a last breath. Unless Jesus returns again, the statistics are pretty clear. We will all have a last breath. But then it says, this, but whoever loses their life for me, I'm going to save it. Like, not just here uh, uh, on this life, obviously, you're going to have a purpose in it, but it, live it eternally. We're going to have this life that is e eternal. I heard a, a true story uh, not that long ago about a woman who was a missionary. And I don't know, remember where she was a missionary to, but she, she was a missionary, and she was having some, uh, she was having some heart issues. And her son lived in the States, and her son was a doctor, and her son incur or encouraged her to come back to get this heart checked out. So the, her, her, uh, her son uh, set her up with a, a friend of his that was this, this uh, heart doctor, and she went and saw him. And the doctor was able to diagnose what was wrong with her heart and said, here's the deal. If you go back on the mission field, here's what I'm telling you. If you go back on the mission field, I guarantee you nothing. You might have one day, you might have one week, you might have one year, but obviously the stress and the strain of it is not healthy for you. You come back here, you live here in the States, you live maybe with your son, and you might have another 25, 30 years of life ahead of you. So you have, you're at this kind of defining moment in life, you have to decide, do you want, do you value your life or do you not? And so the woman went home from the doctor really kind of wrestling with it, uh, what to do, and she kind of came up with the quote, which is kind of what I, I tell this sermon, this idea is, is whose life is this anyways? Is it really my life, or have I already surrendered this life to the Lord? True story, she ended up going back on the mission field, deciding, I'm, no, God has called me there, and God doesn't call everybody to go on the mission field, but God called her there, and she was going to be obedient to go back, and the story is, is that she lived another 25 years until she passed. And now, just because you follow God doesn't guarantee that. She could have went there the next day and died, but would God still have been good? The answer is yes. Would God still have been faithful? Yes. Because we aren't guaranteed, we are not guaranteed anything but this idea of whose life is it anyways.
Matthew 13, 44 through 46. One, a couple of my, some of my favorite parables will be on your screen. Here's what it says. It says this, the kingdom of heaven. And when it says the phrase kingdom of heaven, don't get confused with heaven itself. Kingdom of heaven is basically this idea of the rule and reign of the Lord in your life. So it's living in this proper relationship as we're supposed to live with Christ. The kingdom of heaven, a right relationship with God, is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he found this treasure in this field. He hid it again, and then in his joy, he went and he sold everything he had, got rid of everything he had because he wanted to buy that field. And then it says another story. Again, the kingdom of heaven. Again, this relationship with God. It's like this merchant who's like searching for these fine pearls. And when he found the one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had bought it. And he had and he bought it. Similar stories. One man stumbled by the treasure, and by accident. Another man was seeking after it, but both were willing to give up everything. And this is what this passage is leading leading us to. He's saying this, if you want to follow me, if you want to follow me, whoever wants to be my disciple, you've got to deny yourself. You need to take up your cross and follow me. This idea, and and if you want to save your life, if you want to try to protect your life and get out of this world has to offer, you're going to lose it anyways. You want real life, you can find it in, in only in me. And so that's why I would encourage, and that's why one of my favorite passages, I encourage you that a relationship with God is worth everything. Is, this, a relationship with God is worth everything. It's worth getting all you have, like this passage says, and getting rid of all of it to say, hey, I have this relationship with him. It's worth, it's worth it all, which leads to the very last point in this. Number three is this, the warning during, su- uh, during su- su- uh, suffering and sacrifice for his church. Look at, uh, look at verses 26 and 27. Whoever is ashamed of me in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in, in, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Now, the question you would need to ask as you look at this passage is why would these men be ashamed? I mean, they left everything to follow Jesus. They left their families to follow this rabbi. Why would they be ashamed? Well, don't forget context matters. Don't forget what he said earlier in the passage in verse 22. He said that he would have to suffer, this rabbi would have to suffer, he would be rejected, and he would be killed. To me, in this world's perspective, that doesn't sound like a real winner, does it? In fact, as they read this, they would be considered that this, if this happens to a rabbi, these guys would be losers, right? Because the rabbi was, was suffered, had to suffer. He was killed. He was put on trial. They're thinking that, and so it had been very easy for them to think, well, then I'm going to be ashamed of this. Because I gave up my entire life. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been, like, fooled by something or whatever, but if you, you know, like, let's say somebody comes to you and says, hey, invest all your money in this whole thing, and you invest all your money, and then that, and that person walks away, and they take all your money, and you're embarrassed. Like, I can't believe it. These guys left everything in their lives to follow, uh, to follow this rabbi. And he's saying in this text that I'm going to be, I'm gonna be uh, denied. I'm going, to be, uh, I'm going to be turned away from. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be suffer. I'm going to be rejected. All that. So it would have been very easy for them to have this mindset of, of, kind, of kind of being ashamed. You ever, you ever been ashamed to be with somebody? Probably we all have. I was, a, I was the, the baby of the family, and so I'm sure my brother and sister were, <laughs> were often ashamed to be around me. Uh, but yeah, we, we have that. And like, it's tough for us to understand uh, from their perspective why they'd be ashamed, but when Jesus says this word, it makes a little bit more sense. Now to us... Why would we ever be ashamed of, G- of, of Jesus in our life? I mean, think of what Jesus did. Not only did, did he, he come and he came to this world and he said all these things in text and all this truth, but not only that, he actually he resurrected from the dead. Like, nobody else has done that. Like, we should have today, in 2024, we should have no reason to be ashamed of Jesus because he said he, he did the thing he, he said he would do. We have no reason to be ashamed, but for these men, who didn't have the future ahead of them, they, they just had this faith, they didn't have, have this prophecy fulfilled, it would be a lot more difficult for them. So imagine, imagine today, if you could stockpile everything. If you could stockpile all the money in the world, you could gold, silver, uh, houses, property, cars, position, power, the question in your bulletin is this. What item, what item or material value is worth your eternity? And I hope you can answer the question, none of it is. None of it is. Again, verse 25, what good is it for someone to gain the entire world, gain all the things of this world, yet lose their very soul, or you lose their very self? 
this passage in here, Jesus is really calling us to. In fact, when the crowds would get big, Jesus would often ask the question of some level of count the cost. Is it worth it to follow me? I himself had to suffer, be rejected, and killed. You must uh, take up your cross. You must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Not an easy call. But he says, when you do it, when you do that, you'll actually gain life. You'll actually have life. A life lost in the gospel is not regrettable. A life lost in this world to all the things of this world is tragic. It's going after all these things because we can't take any of it with us. But this is actually true life. I hope you're not ashamed of the name of Christ. The Bible gives warning against it. We should never be ashamed of it. Why? He created all this. He sustained all this. He resurrected no one could do this. In fact, listen to what Romans 1.16, listen to what Paul says. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. It's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. There's no other name that can bring salvation but Jesus alone. That's why he's not ashamed of the gospel. And he said it was first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. So call us name. Call us Jesus freak. Call us archaic. Call us closed-minded. Call us brainwashed. None of that matters because ultimately what we're called by by Jesus, is we're called a child of God. We're called somebody who is fully forgiven. We are, we are justified through Christ. I want to share one more story with you. You may, you may recall this story. Um, back in 2015, there was a, a mist of, uh, in the midst of all this escalating violence by ISIS in, in the Middle East. Uh, and we've got a, a, a painting of it up there. Um, a group of 21 Christian men uh, in Egypt were, were captured by these uh, these soldiers in, in uh, Libya. And these men were mostly poor men who were providing for their family, did farm work in that. Um, they became captors. And they were given the option of this. It says, renounce your faith in Jesus or face execution. And so the rhetorical question that you need to ask yourself is, what would you do in that situation? Would you renounce the name of Jesus or would you be willing to, to die and face execution? And despite the terror, all 21 of them, 2015, all 21 of them chose, refused to deny their faith in Christ. And we know from the amen, yeah, and we know that their boldness, their unwavering trust in Christ, that these, these guys proclaim Christ, and that's what it means, and they understood this idea, they had to live it out, what it means to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. They had no idea maybe waking up that day, or maybe they had no idea the week before this is what's going to happen, but they had to decide if, if it means... If it means my life, I'm willing to go down because I know God is going to be with me and I trust him. He's going to take me with me. Uh, I know that. I, I, I have all that trust. I have that, that confidence. And when they were martyred in, in this Libyan beach, their last words were, Yah Rabbi Yeshua, which means, oh, Lord Jesus. Almost like this idea of, oh, I'm going to be with you. Like they couldn't wait for that moment to be with them. That's what attested faith looks like. So the, so the question that we have to, I'm the, the worship team, come on up here. The question that we need to be thinking about, it won't be on your screen, but is this Matthew 10, 32 through 33. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me, I will also disown before my Father in heaven. You know, in our own lives, we may never. Statistically, we're probably not going to be called to the same level of persecution, but we need to be willing to. We need to be willing to do this. We need to be bold for Christ. That means sometimes it's standing for our faith in really challenging situations, challenging situations with family, coworkers, whatever those things may be, sharing our faith with others, living out the gospel of Jesus, denying myself. It's not about myself. Taking up my cross, meaning I'm willing to suffer for this gospel as Jesus suffered for me. I'm willing to suffer for this gospel, even if it means my own life. I'm willing to do it. Certainly my own Comfort and be courageous and under, unashamed for living out this gospel message. And just like the 21 refused to deny Christ, we're called to stand firm in our faith. And knowing that our, our boldness, our boldness is not going to uh, go away unnoticed by our Heavenly Father. I love in this passage in verse 25. 26, it gives us the promise, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in glory. This idea, he's going to come again. And so that's the promise we have. So today, if you've never made him Lord and Savior, if you don't have a saving relationship with him, we'd love to talk to you about what it means. And again, it's not about us. It's not about us doing all these things for, for Jesus to love us. No, no, he already loves us. 
But out of that response of justification, just as if I'd never sinned, we have this life of, of not easy beliefism, but instead it's this life of surrender. I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to take up my cross. I'm going to follow you. And when I do that, and when I do that very thing, it is then where I will find true life. If you don't know that true life, if you've never, if you've never made him Lord and Savior of your life, man, we want, to, we want to encourage you towards that. We'd love to talk to you about what it means to have a saving relationship with him. Some of you just need prayer. Uh, you're struggling. Like You read these words and understand the trials and tribulations that are going to come along with being a Christian. You understand the weight of those words that understand the weight of if I truly f- follow Jesus, it means this. This is what I have to surrender in my life. It's easy on a Sunday morning at 11.45 to say yes. But you know the struggles that come on a Monday morning. It's like this is what it means to be surrendered. Lord, I want to surrender my life because when I surrender my life, it is then where I actually find life. Or if you just need prayer. And that's why we, part of the reason we meet together, it can be in our, our Christian walk, it can be challenging. Sometimes we feel like we're doing this all on our own. No, you got others doing it as well. There's this idea that we together encourage one another towards living this life fully surrendered to the Lord. So if you make a decision, would you come as we stand and sing together?